Well, hello, Toronto. What an amazing way to get off to talk about 5G and connectivity. Thank you, Duncan, for your excellent overview on how to work with innovation. Innovation is really my passion, and uh, uh, I am here to talk to you about an amazing technology uh, that I know that most of you already have heard about, 5G. And why 5G is so much more than just connectivity. So, I work at Ericsson Research. We are 700 people in over seven locations all over the world. And uh, we work together on the next generation of technology. We have uh, provided a substantial part of Ericsson's impressive patent portfolio where we have over 49,000 patents. And my unit has a very special assignment. We are to be the outside voice at Ericsson Research and uh, challenge our engineers to think about how new technology can create value for people, industries, and which effect it will have on society. In order to do this, we work very multidisciplinary. So we have everything from sustainability, academic researcher, to design designers who work with uh, forward-thinking design concepts such as hologram calling, to market researchers, and of course, a few engineers and computer programmers. In the consumer lab part, we are constantly following what is happening on the global market. And each year, we interview more than 100,000 respondents all over the globe. We do research in 40 countries, and the material that we have statistically represents 1.1 billion users uh, in the world. On the industry lab side, uh, we do a lot of research on sustainability, AI and its effects on people and society, of course. And then we are going into the over 40 cutting edge industry research programs that we have at Ericsson uh, Research, which are looking into how we can use 5G connectivity and IoT to create value uh, in industry segments. Um, so diversity is really key, and we try to work with this actively. I can't tell you how many times I eat lunch with my, one of my colleagues who are from different parts of the world, and they actually challenge me to uh, expand my thinking to new horizons from different corners of the world. But 5G then, what is that really? How many here? understands really what 5G is and what difference it can make for us in everyday life. A few hands up, that's really good. Well, just to give you a little bit of an overview, let's go into the different Gs and have a look at what they have actually done for us. So the first G was actually about cutting the cord to the telephone. And do you remember those really heavy phones that we used to carry it around, much like with a, a suitcase, right? Then with 2G, we actually uh, did uh, put the digital into telecommunications, and we digitalized the transference of voice into digital code. With 3G, uh, data and internet came into our mobile phones. And with 4G and the smartphone, it really took us into new dimensions. And now our networks are mostly carrying video data because we use that very much in everyday life. So the first 4Gs has really been a lot about consumers and how we actually uh, use this in our everyday life to communicate. But 5G will bring on a totally different era, because here we will enable 
how to connect millions and millions of devices with sensors. And we will also be able to do critical connectivity with very, very low latency. And this allows us to remote control machinery, have autonomous drive in connected vehicles, and even do remote surgery uh, and transform healthcare. But what does this entail for uh, uh, the future? I really like to start with the past in order to understand how a small change in behavior can actually change the future. So I want to take you to an ordinary Friday night when Consumer Lab actually started in 1995 to the 3G era and how this has transformed our everyday lives to today. Finally, a family weekend. Anna thinks as she witnesses her three children dash back and forth between the movie sections. They've already ended up renting the same film four times this year. She knows this, but still she gladly lets the endless charade of touching, comparing, and feeling the plastic covers continue. So change will never be as slow again, right? Um, I think that this movie is so very symbolic and it represents the large change that uh, all industries are going through right now. We are moving the product-based era where we used to compete with the latest technology, uh, the highest throughput, the greatest capacity, or the highest re resolution in a videotape, the latest version, to a service-based era. And this service-based era is really all about the experience. And this is why Duncan's lecture was so really, really good. Because it's all about capturing the value that is important to consumers, or if you're in a business, business environment, to industries. So, I mean, what we still deliver into the same situation, the Friday night in the sofa, the service that gets chosen is the one that delivers most value to the consumers. Theoretically, we actually could download movies illegally through uh, the, the internet, but we are actually willing to pay for the services that are really smooth and easy to access in our everyday life. And this is not only true on the B2C side, but also on the industry side. We see this coming more and more. So to capture this new value and really uh, investigate how we can meet needs with companies and consumers is essential in this new era. And I think that with 4G, maybe this little movement has become the most important movement in the world. Because this is how we actually access information, it is how we start our purchasing processes, and this is how we make a lot of our decisions based on the information in the smartphone. I usually say that we are right now living in a smartphone paradigm, and we are so in love with our smartphones, some say that we even look at them a couple of thousand times every day that we have a hard time actually lifting our gaze from the smartphone and imagine another type of reality. But this might be coming along real soon, and I will tell you why in just a little while. So, what about 5G then? Is there a market for 5G? And where can 5G create value? Of course, we have done our homework as, uh, on this, and 
on our homepage, you can find a report called the 5G Business Potential. And in that slide, you will have uh, all the data, details of, of uh, how we have calculated what type of revenues we can expect in different industry verticals. But I want to take two things to you that you can take away from this slide. And the first is that 5G will come into a lot of different industry verticals. We can see this happening uh, in everything from financial services and entertainment to smart manufacturing uh, and uh, utilities. And the second one is that it is happening quite fast after the 5G launch. So in the first four years, it is essential to be there, go in and uh, define the market. But what does this really mean in real uh, examples? I will just take you to two examples of uh, industry 4.0 to show you a little bit about how we actually can create value for industries in new ways. And the first case here, uh, we went to Fraunhofer, which is a German manufacturing uh, company who does parts for jet engines. And uh, uh, this shiny metal thing that you see on the left is actually called a blisk, and it's a very essential part of the jet engine. We talked to Fraunhofer, and they said, anything you can do to improve the efficiency of manufacturing this blisk would be fantastic, because uh, it takes a lot of time to manufacture it, uh, 24 hours for one part, and uh, it is also really, really sensitive, and it's really hard to redo it if you, uh, 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 if you go wrong. So there were a lot of scrap materials, and it's really high energy uh, demanding production as well. So what we did was that we provided 5G connectivity, and were able to steer the very precision uh, demanding manufacturing process of this. And this actually saved this factory 360 million euros every year. Moreover, it also helped to reduce carbon emissions by 60 million tons, uh, metric tons per year. The other project that we did, which is really interesting, there we started to think about how can we actually improve the work environment for people uh, working in the mines. And what we did there was that we underground first did uh, remote control machineries and an AR, augmented reality, uh, projection of the mine, so we could actually check the blast effect of a blast without sending down one person. Uh, we also connected Boliden's open pit, and here uh, we could actually see that that little change that we did with remote controlled machinery there, there produced an annual saving of 2.5 million euros and it also reduced carbon emissions by 9.4 thousand metric tons per year. That is pretty impressive, I think. And what I think is really important here is that we start from the value. How can we actually produce value uh, for these companies? And then we go in and investigate how, how connectivity might be added. <clears throat> Moreover, I think what you see here is a transition in an era where we can start to get paid for business outcomes instead of single pro bundles of products. So we can set our business model to deliver on a business outcome, increased efficiency, lower scraps, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, instead of se selling equipment piece by piece. And this is really what we need to do. Uh, and to do this in a way that is accessible and attractive to people, we need to start to work also 
with the easiness of use and the experience side of things. And this is true not only in business to consumer industries, like Duncan explained, but also in business to business environments. Also, digitalization of our industries is a really important tool, not only for cost efficiencies, but also to get uh, the carbon emissions in the world to reduce. So last year, our sustainability research, together with leading international academic researchers and the organization Future Earth, uh, did a report called the Climate Experimental Roadmap. And in it, we could see that if we actually digitalize the right way, with the right type of energy sources and so on, using only the technologies that are available today, we might reduce carbon emissions by 15% by 2030. If we would add even more technologies that are coming now with AI, cloud computing, and so on, uh, the changes would probably be even more uh, pronounced. So what about consumers then? Do they really care about 5G? And do they even know that it's coming? Well, last year, we actually published in January uh, one of the world's first global studies on consumers' expectations of 5G. And in that study, we could see that seven out of 10 smartphone users across the globe say that they are aware of 5G, and four out of 10 stated that they were willing to pay. And the expectations of 5G technology and consumers are really high. Seven out of 10 consumers in the US, they already then stated that 5G will enable new apps, services, and all sorts of things that are impossible today. And what I think is really interesting is the new study that we released just now. Uh, we can see that the excitement levels has risen among the, the world's smartphone users. So 70% say that they are excited by 5G today, whereas 67% say that they are willing to pay for 5G services. So what are these services then? Well, in this study, which you can download from our uh, homepage, it's called the 5G Consumer Potential. We tested 32 use cases across six different use case areas. And in this slide, you can see the uh, use cases that rendered an over 50% interest levels among consumers around the world. I want you to take away a few things from this slide. And that is that consumers actually do see a lot of value in 5G use cases, and they are willing to pay. And they expect most use cases to go mainstream in the market already two to three years after uh, 5G is going to launch. And here, the new services are really, really important. So in order to gain this, we, uh, we really need to innovate and come up with these new services. And this is why initiatives like Anchor are so important to get this innovation going and get those services out in the market. Also, what consumers says is that smartphones, that was the driver of the 4G uh, era, is not necessarily what is going to drive the next generation of networks. Uh, they are actually asking for more features and very much immersive features in the smartphones. And what we see is that consumers today expect that uh, all, AR glasses, augmented reality glasses, will be the next new thing actually driving 5G uh, uh, adaptation. They see a multi-device era happening where smartphones will become one of many devices that we will live in. But you can imagine, if we think about it, service innovation with AR and immersive experience as a base 
will look very different than what we actually have today. And 50% of the smartphone users actually expect us all to be wearing uh, AR glasses by 2025. So <clears throat> I have talked a lot about uh, that we need to innovate and we need these in initiatives like Encore to get all diverse competences and brains together to get the innovation and the startups going to actually capture the value of 5G. And as you can see on the global map, we have the use cases that are expecting to happen within two uh, to three years. But what happens if you go to a market that is very much in the forefront of the global development, like the US? You see this happening. The expectations is that this will happen much sooner uh, for much more of the use cases. And I think that this is so exciting because it really uh, presses for the importance of 5G as a big uh, innovation platform, making use of instant connectivity, cloud edge computing, and advanced analytics uh, and technologies uh, with immersiveness like uh, AR. So to conclude, there is no time to waste Let's go and innovate and grab the future together. Thank you very much.